Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. Josh Trent is the founder of Wellness Force Media and host of one of the top ranked iTunes podcasts, Wellness Force Radio. And if you haven't heard it, you've got to listen to it. Josh has spent the past 16 years as a researcher, trainer, and facilitator discovering the physical and emotional intelligence for humans to thrive in our modern world, whatever that means. After publishing over 300 high-level interviews with some of the most respected minds in health, wellness, and self-help industries, Josh has been spotlighted in major wellness media outlets such as Onnit, Spartan, Seal Fit, and Paleo FX. So in 2019, Josh became the CEO of Civilized Caveman, helping men and women live better through practical solutions in wellness, truth, and paleo-friendly recipes. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Awesome. Look, it's such a pleasure to have you on. And um, I didn't know if it had happened or not because I know you uh, do a bit of travel and really um, – Live the life of of a journey, and and I love it because um, I feel like I can sort of live that life with you a bit by uh, watching what you go through and and being, I guess, a leader um, who who learns along the way. And so, thank you for for that. Oh, I received that. It feels good to hear you say that. I think we all are on this world for unique purposes. And the fact that honestly, anyone cares about what I'm doing or what I'm up to is pretty damn cool. <laughs> you know, actually, that's how I feel. Actually, Josh, I think actually, I only realized this today, but I was listening to one of your podcasts about your experience with ayahuasca. And um, I remember you saying like, you're just the average sort of person that would never really consider this sort of thing. And it, you just Ooh. sort of, it happened to you. And, and I'm like, okay, I've got to do ayahuasca because that's me. I'm not the sort of person that would do ayahuasca either. Uh, and I had an amazing experience with that. So so I've got to thank you for that, actually. Oh, um, uh, you're so welcome. So so did that come after hearing about my kind of journey? It did, yeah. So oh, I, it was probably so cool. about a month after. So that okay. was cool. And then on another tangent, um, I have always been into yoga. I'm a yoga instructor and whatever else, and, but I've – in the last sort of two years have really been um, discovering the breath and the importance of breath and, and, and done a lot of self-study as well as self-practice. Um, and I've interviewed some great people um, around breathing techniques and that sort of thing and then listened to your experiences in Thailand with Som- Somar and so, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's great. And, um, yeah, so I, I've got lots to talk to you about. But I guess before we even start, can you, can you tell us how you got into all of this and, and, and what's your life like now and what was it like before and, and why are you doing all this? <laughs> I love that. Three big canon questions all laid out in the same sentence. And and those are great questions because, look, before anybody talks about what they do, it, you better damn know why they do it. I mean, that's the why are we here if it's not connected to something from our heart? So, you know, speaking of heart, like my heart when I was young was pulled in a lot of different directions. My mom was manic bipolar. My dad left home when I was real young. And so I was I chose to be brought into this world and have a very challenging existence because I think my soul knew that by that challenge, I would be able to receive gifts that would help me grow later and be of service later. And so, you know, with my mom having her illness and my dad not being around, you know, to no surprise, I'm like pretty stressed out as a young kid. But here's the thing, Ali, I didn't know how to deal with these emotions. Like when you're a little kid, you don't know how to deal with emotions, emotional intelligence. What is that? Like no one talks about that in the 1980s. That's where I grew up in East County, La Mesa. Like, so in that situation, I really didn't know what to do. And I found a drug and a lot of people find this drug and um, the drug is food. So I would use food to quell my emotions, to not deal essentially with with the intense feelings that I was feeling because I would just eat them away. Now with that lack of intelligence emotionally and, and physically and by using and abusing a drug called food, now I'm 21 years old, I'm 280 pounds, I'm in a job I hated, I was a Mercedes Benz technician, I'm in a relationship that was the wrong relationship. So everything in my life was queuing me up for a massive sledgehammer hit. And um, I was at this party and I was drinking alcohol, which is something I did in my early 20s a lot. And I just had this moment where it was literally the first time I had felt 
a connection to like a higher power or God, whatever you want to say, you know, something else out there that's besides just us. And I was so frustrated and sad and how I felt in my unhealthy body that I slammed the party cup down. It was like a red party cup. And I, I just had this feeling wash over me. And, and it was this voice that said, there's more to life than this. There's something more to life than this. You know, life isn't about whatever you're doing. And so I slam the cup down. I run home drunk for like three miles. I get on the computer and I, I typed in, how do I be healthy? Or I don't exactly remember what I typed in, but it was something like, how do I lose weight? I think. So then like 18 months after that, I'm 22, 23, I'm figuring out how to lose weight, gaining it back, doing all these starvation diets, really just having a challenging time understanding this health aspect. And then I got so frustrated that I said, you know what, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to move to Hawaii. I sold literally everything I owned. I moved to Hawaii. And for six months, I just dove into fitness and nutrition and health, hiking and fishing and just being in nature, being in the, in the incredible power of nature. And I got to this point where I knew I wanted to serve people in personal training. And so I left. I, I went to Las Vegas and trained out there. That training career spanned 10 years and coaching 10,000 hours, um, which then I led myself to what David Data calls the space between stories. I think that's actually Char Charles Eisenstein, the space between stories. Data calls it the purpose is sometimes to be in the question of your purpose. And that is your purpose within itself. After training, like I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I still wanted to help people. So I went to corporate America committed spiritual suicide in a cube, <laughs> made a bunch of good money, but really like was hating my life. And I got the beautiful gift. And I say beautiful gift of being fired in 2014. It was the most empo empowering thing that could have ever happened to me because it put me on the path of founding Wellness Force and of launching this podcast and of, you know, having all these millions of people and all this impact. And like, yeah, that would have never happened if I didn't at least listen to that little voice inside of me that said, there's more to life than this. Yeah, but the thing is, Josh, so many people have that and ignore it. I'm sure they must have it, but they ignore it. Yeah. How I, think, I think because it's so scary. Like, look, the courage to answer the call is something that we cultivate. Courage is not something that everyone is born with. You have to cultivate it. Like, think of emotions as different plants in a garden. So do you have a garden at home or do you do you do any farming? Let me let me paint the picture for you, Josh. I live in Manhattan. I'm on the 27th floor <laughs> okay. uh, looking out right. at the Empire State as we speak. Okay. Um, okay. I've sort of got a garden, but it's about two, two inches by <laughs> 10. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for anyone at all that's ever grown a plant or garden, you know, if you don't water it, if you don't feed it, it dies. Well, it's the same thing with courage. Like, just because we have a voice inside of us doesn't mean that voice is going to be allowed to direct us unless we lovingly cultivate the courage to listen, to listen. If we're not listening to the voice that comes up inside of us because it's too scary. I mean, look, this is why alcohol, drugs, marijuana, pornography, shopping, overworking, all these weapons of mass distraction. This is why they're all out there is because people are so afraid to listen to what their inner knowing is telling them. And that's a very nuanced place to be. Mm. And what's also funny is that I'm sure it it, it came up a, a several times for you. L look what I'm giving up, all this money and, and you know, all this study that I've done to become an engineer at, at Mercedes and, and, and all of this, you know, look what I'm giving up. And yet I'm sure you never wanted to go back at any stage. Oh, I mean, there was a place, I'll never forget this. Wow, this is really cool. I'm having a memory like in real time on your show. I've never talked about this. I was driving in the car coming home from being fired. And you know what I felt? I felt fear, but I also felt invigoration, renewal, potential, excitement, because I knew like our soul, my soul in that moment, it knew that my path was not to be in corporate America, sitting in a cubicle, making phone calls. And I'm not saying that to hurt anyone or to say that if you do have a job in a cubicle that you're doing anything wrong. No, that's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that wasn't my path. And I think my inner self knew it all along the mm -hmm. whole time. And I was just playing a story, which is what we all do. We play stories to ourselves and our minds that keep us safe. The ego that we have inside of us, Ali, 
It's the same ego that wants people to eat chocolate cake at midnight, to not work out, to not speak your truth, to have a safe job, to make sure that you're falling in line with your clothing and make sure you're only talking about certain things at dinner. It's all bull. Can I cuss on your show? I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. Okay. It's all fucking bullshit. It's all lies. And the reality is that everyone is individuated consciousness. You're, you're Ali Watts. Like you're doing Ali Watts. I'm doing Josh Trent. People that are listening are doing themselves, yet there's so much narrative that we have to fall in line and we have to do things, quote, a certain way. Otherwise, the ego gets in fear. And, and that's where everything turns astray for people. And that's where health and disease um, really have their nexus. Yeah. And it's almost like you're, you're living your life for someone else because I'm sure someone out there would have been disgruntled that you did that or, or that you felt that they would be disgruntled for you to just give all that up. Right. And what, here's what happens when someone and, and I'm, I'm just one example of, of billions. Right. I'm one mirror of here's what happens when you follow your truth. It's going to be really hard. You're going to have nights where you want to quit. It's going to suck and it's going to be the most invigorating, beautiful, transformational and reciprocal love type environment you could ever imagine. Because the reason why people get upset or the reason why people judge when someone follows their dream or, or takes on a new project or does something that's, quote, unsafe, you know why they get angry? It's because they're reminded that deep inside of themselves, there's a dream that they're not following. And so it makes people feel better to chastise or to have criticism of somebody who is following their dream or following their heart because that same exact thing breathes inside of them. It's just been buried by the stories that these critics are, have told themselves. So true. Josh, I've heard you talk about, and you've mentioned it already, this emotional intelligence and, you know, like this emotional, emotional versus physical intelligence. Can you, can you share us your thoughts and, and maybe help us understand this a bit more? Yeah. I, you know, what's interesting is I used to think intelligence was about how smart somebody was. And then I re I realized that's absolutely the opposite of intelligence. Like we have in this world more information than has ever existed. I mean, think about this. We have a phone in our pocket that has more computing power than a spaceship that went to outer space in 1960. Are you kidding me? Like we live in an age now where there is so much information. There's so much quote knowledge out there. There's so many smart people putting out things that doesn't make somebody intelligent. True intelligence has three phases. If someone is deemed intelligent, it's because they have a skill set of acquiring knowledge. Yes, that's true. It's important to listen to podcasts. It's important to read books. It's important to go to conferences and learn, you know, to be a vessel for information. And right after that, though, and this is where most people stop, is they don't apply it. They don't actually go home and journal or work out or stretch or eat the foods or do the elimination diets. Like they don't go there because that's where the real work is. And then after you've done enough applying and gathering, the true phase of intelligence, and this is where we all know when we meet certain people where we just love them or we really resonate with them or we, we respect them. There's just something, there's a je ne sais quoi about certain people. It's because they live and breathe in that third phase of intelligence. And that third phase of intelligence is embodiment. Somebody embodies the gathering and the application that they've received on their life path. So gathering, applying, and then embodiment. Embodiment means that it is part of their body. It is embodied inside of them. The information that they've gathered and applied is now a living, walking, living library of that person and manifested in a physical form. That spirit that lives inside of their bodies has embodied all the lessons of our 3D world. And, and true intelligence is something that I'm just so curious about. You know, this, this physical intelligence, this emotional intelligence, I'll be honest with you, it, it's all fed by a pool of spirituality. Everything we do has some spiritual component, um, but the physical and the emotional intelligence are two conversations within their own. Mm. And so is it almost like knowledge versus wisdom beautifully put think about this if you have knowledge you have leverage but if you don't apply that leverage then you'll never gain traction or go anywhere so there's intelligence which is here's a good example when i was to go back to a mechanic there was a guy who could uh, take apart an engine in four hours and he could not break a sweat at all he was a 30-year journeyman there was a young uh, apprentice who came in and it would take that person eight hours, double the time to take apart an engine. And he would sweat the whole time with stress. Now, what was the difference between the two? They both had knowledge. 
They both had, quote, information. What was the limiting factor in the 30-year journeyman and in the first-year apprentice? The limiting factor, the missing piece, if you will, was embodiment. It was the embodiment and the self-trust that this 30-year journeyman knew exactly how to take apart that engine. He wasn't stressed. He knew how to save time, and he trusted himself. He trusted himself. That's why it took him half as much time, and he never broke one piece of sweat. And that can be applied to any industry at all, right? Whether it's fitness or health or nutrition or spirituality or self-development, there's doing things intelligently, and then there's doing things with vigorous force, you know, like like – lots of energy and, and pushing a boulder up a hill. They'll both get to the top of the mountain, but you know, the journey is going to be quite different. Yeah, Josh, I'm really interested to know, I know you've interviewed some amazing people. Who for you would be that person that you would say really resembles this true intelligence? You know, out of all the people I've interviewed, the person that comes to mind the most is Paul. Is <laughs> oh, you knew I was going to say that. <laughs> I just knew you'd say it. <laughs> you knew I was going to say Paul. Well, the reason is, is because I've met with Paul. So for people that don't know, Paul Check, have you talked about him on the show before, I'm guessing? I haven't actually, but um, okay, so yes, I should have. <laughs> Paul's the founder of the Czech Institute, 30 plus years in holistic health, um, has many patents, uh, many things where he was really the cutting edge for things being in gyms like Swiss balls and um, functional training, um, wood chop patterns, PNF, things like that. So- a lot of what we do now is actually modeled off of Czech's early work. And what led Czech to wellness is exactly what leads him as a spirit guide medicine man. So I look at the gathering, the application, and the embodiment phases of intelligence. And I think Paul proves by his living example, his body is that living library. His mind and soul is that living library of true embodiment intelligence. Um, and I say that because I've, I've spent you know an entire day with him at his home multiple podcasts, multiple emails and phone calls. So I just have a sense that he is one of the people, one of those big way showers for all of us to guide us back to the truth. I mean, he's it, you, at the core of your question, Ali, it's, it's literally, you're almost saying, Hey, who can we trust and who's telling the truth? Mm, mm, <laughs> that, that's exactly. really what you're asking, isn't mm. it? Yeah, it is. And it also, and, and and like I said, I knew that would be the answer for you. And, and I'm sure that would actually be the answer for many people. And the reason, I, I guess, why I wanted to talk a bit about him too, is that I'm very interested in that a lot of people like yourself, like Paul, like myself, we all come from this fitness background. Yes. But we, I don't know whether the right, you know, whether the, whether the right word is evolve into a more spiritual way of being. I loved how you put that because think about the word evolve. There's the word love in there, right? So evolution is how much we're loving ourselves, how much we're practicing self-love. And I think, look, on the journey of self-love, there's a few key for, <laughs> a few key steps. The first step in, in the journey of self-love is just awareness, right? Like if, if we're at least aware, like, hey, um, Allie Watts, she's not just a health professional. She's not just a podcaster. She is a unique blend of physical and emotional intelligence with ties to her past lineage and a voice that guides people that people trust. And she also loves to eat certain types of foods on a Tuesday. Like there's a lot to you, right? And there's a lot to me. And so if we can start being aware, that's the first step. Who are we? What is our awareness of ourself? And this is on the journey of self-love, right? In that awareness, we then start to learn like what the hell is true and what's not true. Now that I know who I am, now that I've taken somewhat of an inventory of my awareness of who Ali Watts or Josh Trent is, then what? Well, then we do an inventory, right? And in the inventory phase, that's where we take out what doesn't serve us. And that's where we double down on the things that do. And the inventory phase can literally be you in a park with a, with a notepad and you write 10 things you love and 10 things you don't like. And that's where you start. We don't have to get complicated here in the inventory phase. After the inventory phase, then we take inspired action. And for me, when I was telling you I was 280 pounds, I was, I was so upset. I mean, I was receiving so much contrast of just feeling like hell inside my body and my mind that literally pain is what drove me to do this inventory. And, and when I took the inventory, I hated myself. I didn't love Josh. I hated his body. I hated the fact that my life had worked out the way it did. I hated my parents. I just hate, hate, hate. There's a lot of us are filled up with hate and we don't know how to let it go. And so 
then I found fitness and it gave me some temporary reprieve. But you know, the part of me that like wasn't served through fitness and a lot of us fall into this as, as health professionals or trainers, when we're busy shining light on other people for a living, it's really easy to keep the dark parts of ourselves dark. And you see this with yoga instructors, with fitness professionals, with anyone who's, who's their life is to be uh, um, um, serving others or the betterment of others. It's so, so easy, Ali, for people in those positions to seem like they have it all together. Well, because guess what? They're the ones in control. When I was a trainer, I was the one telling people what sets to do. I was designing their workouts. I was creating periodization tables. I was making their meal plans. I was doing everything. Nobody ever was looking at what my parts were because I was so busy shining shining light on other people. And I think what really happens to us in fitness, to go back to your initial comment of evolution and love, is that anyone at all who's a health or fitness professional, it's a natural progression for them to start with the head and leave with the heart. In other words, they start by training people and understanding how to move people through dynamic ranges of motion and how to get clients weight loss. And then they start feeling like something's missing. I think most fitness professionals can agree to this. Like, well, what else is there besides diet and exercise? Like, why are my clients not losing weight? And then they go down the other path of, oh, it's because my client has existential stress from trauma. Well, I don't know how to deal with that because I've never dealt with that myself. Well, then you see what you see what happens there, Ali? They hit a roadblock. They're not really able to move their clients forward anymore because they haven't been in the shoes of where their client actually lives. Mm. Yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting, and, and and I've never really thought about it like that. But you're right. I think a lot of coaches feel their role is to coach, and so therefore they do keep those dark secrets, uh, if you will, um, and 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 don't really get challenged because someone doesn't try to coach them. Yeah. And I want to be respectful of all coaches and trainers. We need you. Like our world needs you now more than ever. So in mm. no way am I saying that no one should or should not be a coach or a trainer. We, we're always going to need you. Like you have a massive part in our community, massive, because you get people moving. And through that movement, that's where the inventory process comes from. Most of the times when people start working out, when they're losing fat, they're also losing emotional weight as well. Right. So so we need trainers. We need coaches to get people moving in the right direction. You are you are a catalyst for these people. And at some point, though, based on your own evolution as a trainer or coach, you're going to start to move in a different direction yourself. That's all I'm saying. Mm. And Josh, I, I believe that your training's changed a lot since you uh, first started as a trainer yourself. What does your like I guess not even necessarily what does yours look like, but what would you, yeah. what, what have you learned to be important things to, I guess, bring health into fitness? Yeah, that's great. I, I, it's funny you mention it that way. Like, how do we bring health into fitness? I love that because people try to actually do it the other way. They're like, well, if I just focus on fitness, then I'll be healthy. No, that's that's the opposite. I loved how you position that as how do I bring the two the, together the other way? I think this in my life, I think before I was run by a lot of demons where I would push myself really hard in the gym, like, you know, like... <laughs> 12% body fat and like having to be perfect and all my meals were in little plastic containers and I had the six pack bag and, um, you know, my entire life just, just circled around like how I physically looked. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Like my whole life was just like, well, how do you look in the mirror, man? Cause if your body's not your billboard, then clients aren't going to train with you. I mean, it was just this scarcity fear tactic that I was using to get temporary results. And so when the wheels fell off the wagon for me, when I stopped being a trainer, I really like had to relearn how to love my body. And so how I bring fitness to, to health and health to fitness, vice versa, is by doing a morning check-in and just asking myself like, well, what do you need the most? You know, just literally talking to myself and saying, what's going to serve you the most today? Is a walk going to serve you? Just taking a quick inventory. And I, I usually do it through breath work. Um, Taking a quick inventory and being like, do you need a walk? Do you feel like going to the gym? Does your body feel strong? 
Uh, do you want to do strength today? Do you want to focus on more cardiovascular training today? Is today more of a mobility day? Do you want to do yoga today? Like asking the question and just figuring out which one calls to me. Um, lately, a lot of what I've been doing is just I've been going on trail runs and I'll just do body weight squats, push ups, and I'll pull up on a tree. You know, and that, that's been really good for me. I haven't been spending a ton of time in the gym. And I think we're always chasing this um, pendulum, Ali, of what's serving us one day and what's serving us the next. Mm. And I believe that you can do that because you're quite in tune with your body and you're free from a lot of the daily stress. I'm not I'm not saying you're free from stress, but I'm definitely not free from stress. <laughs> but, but you, you know, you don't have a right. nine, nine to five job and, and whatever else. And I, I guess the point is that you're quite in tune with your body. I don't know if a lot of our listeners can just go, mm, I wonder how I feel today. I, I think actually, you know what? I feel tired. I'll stay in bed. Um, I, and I think it really depends a bit on your personality. Whereas the A type will go, no, I'm fine. I'm yeah. ready to smash myself. Um, have you got any tips for people that maybe just aren't quite that in tune? I love how you broke that down to ground level because you're right. Sometimes if we only go off of feelings, well, your feeling is going to tell you to sleep in. So I understand that. When I say feelings, I'm talking about like what is the evidence? What are the clues emotionally and kind of physically, mentally, this axis of what's really going to serve somebody? So let me let me break it down on a practical level what I mean. A good tip would be this. If you haven't done breath work or if you haven't done any kind of meditation, you can you could label it however you want. If you haven't done a stillness practice where you're just being still, that's the place to start. And that's before you do any workout at all, any any fitness practice at all. Start there, do a specific breath work, do a specific meditation, and then after that, check in with yourself and be like, "Okay, how do I physically feel in my body? Does my physical body feel tired or is my mind telling me that I'm tired? That differentiation is only going to come when there's stillness before it. Does that make sense? Does that make more sense as a starting point? Yeah, actually, I'm really glad that you brought that up because, I mean, like I said, I've noticed um, the importance of breath um, both during exercise, but obviously if you don't breathe correctly during the day, then you just don't breathe correctly when you work out. And I've also just myself um, noticed the stillness of the mind. And, and so I've actually incorporated breath work in all my programs. Now I run a, a, a health company and we have coaches, but we also have programs and they all now involve daily breathing exercises where I take them through breath work. And mm. I agree with you. First thing in the morning, to set it's it's like setting setting yourself ready to go and yeah. it'll yeah. tell you what to do it'll it, it'll tell your body what what you need so true mm. because look and this is to go a little metaphysical with you and bear with me if you're listening you're like is this guy real <laughs> yes i'm being real like i do have one foot in spirituality but trust me i have another foot in academia and science i'm a very science based learner like i want to know the research before i do anything when i look at the research of breath work and of meditation bar none we know from a scientific perspective if you look at any of the studies on pubmed or nih Meditation and breath work change the way that our nervous system functions. That is just accepted as, as truth. When our nervous system is calm, when we're shifted in the ANS towards the rest and digest branch, this is the parasympathetic, and we're out of fight or flight, which is sympathetic, when we're actually in that space where we can make decisions that are aligned with how we're feeling, then you know what's best for your workout. Let me, let me paint an example. If you're super stressed, your kids are screaming, the you know, your third cup of coffee, and then you decide if you want to work out or not. You tell me, Allie, like, is that going to come from a place of real knowing or is that just going to come from a place of mental patterning, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's funny. We're, we're talking about all this and I, in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, so why did you do seal fit 20, 20 X? What sort of breath work did you do to tell you to do that? <laughs> okay. I hear you. And so with 20X, that for me was, that was 2017. I was 37 years old. Um, this is before I had done some very deep dives into breath work and plant medicine. And I was dealing in 2017 with a lot of anxiety, like just wondering if I could make it, wondering what was going to happen with wellness for us. I mean, literally, this is like two and a half years ago, you know, so this is not that long ago. Mm. And this is a testament to applying, gathering and embodying practices, because I'll be honest with you, in 2017, the embodiment 
phase was something I was seeking. I was seeking the embodiment phase and I wanted to go. I wanted to go to a physical crucible because I think we can learn a lot from the physical body. I think pushing the physical body, especially in a 14 hour overnight Navy SEAL training event, most people would look at that and they'd say, why do you want to go do a rucksack run, soaking wet, being screamed at, doing Murph in the middle of the night. Like, why would you ever want to do that? And you know what my answer was? I said, I want to see what I'm capable of. I want to see what potential lives in me. I want to see where I'll go when things really suck. Mm. I want to understand Josh Trent. Like, I want to understand where he goes. I totally get you. I did an eight day adventure race where you're not really meant to stop to sleep. And if you do, you just do an hour or two. So, um, and eight days. Yeah. Well, it was eight, it was meant to be eight days. I think we, we finished it in six, but oh. yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's one of those, I guess, similar to a seal fit, uh, although longer. Um, wow. and for the same reason, it, it really teaches you a lot about yourself. But um, I'm really intrigued. Um, I, I've read a bit about Silfit 20X. In fact, I think I'd like to do it. I think, I think it sort of almost sounds fun. But can you mm. share your experience with, with it? Yeah. You know, this is really cool. No one's asked me about this in a long time. So I, I really appreciate your question. And I appreciate the timing of your question, too, as it fits into our conversation with health and with fitness. Because I think what drives a lot of people to do these intense events is they're either running to something or they're running from something. Let's be real. Mm. A lot of people that run to these endur- like the Spartan worlds or these massive overnights, they're running from something like they're in a lot of pain and they feel like by putting themselves in more pain then something will leak out. Maybe, or maybe not. Maybe they'll just intensify the pain you're already feeling. What I was doing is I was running towards something. Like I was running towards what I felt in my heart was true. And that was, I'm a badass. I know exactly what to do. I'm fully supported, loved, and trusting in myself. And I know that spirit is on my side. And I knew that that was going to be there for me in the event. I knew that if I could make the event not about me, then I would see how powerful I was. If I could be in an environment with teammates, men and women, that we're all suffering together, well then, as we're all being kind of stabbed with a blade of adversity, then we can bleed out the gratitude. We can bleed out the gratitude for one another, human beings on a team suffering together. I mean, nothing brings together people more than shared suffering. You learn a lot about yourself when you suffer, especially how you show up for other people. This is the big takeaway, Ali, for me, is there was a moment where I was um, – I put down a sandbag. And specifically, these coaches, they mess with you. They they, they really get in your heads, right? And um, we actually did a documentary, a mini documentary of this entire process. So it's on YouTube if people want to watch it. Um, I think it's like One Man's Journey to Seal Fit, 20X, Josh Trent, something like that. Awesome. There was a moment where I dropped I'll, – I'll link to that. Link, link to it because it's so good and, and all of us live inside of the archetype of what I was doing. You know, in other words, we're, we're all kind of doing a 20X whether we know it or not. So I dropped this sandbag just for one second to like, to like tighten my backpack. And the coach goes, Trent, you dropped your sandbag. Everybody's doing push-ups because of you. How does it feel to, for when you don't follow orders that everyone gets to suffer because of you? And I was so angry. I was so angry. I was like, you're, you're messing with me. And I went down. This is what happens to us in our life. Something happens. We make the event about us. Why did he do that? I'm so angry, blah, blah, blah. It was the perfect learning lesson for me. What happened was, is I, I stood in cold water. I was doing push-ups, And on, on one of these push-ups for like my punishment or whatever, I was suffering so much that I lent, I, I kind of like grunted a little bit, like, Ugh. and the coach goes, suffer in silence. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he told me to suffer in silence. And I understood what it was about because w- when I'm showing my pain, when everyone else is going through their pain, it pulls the attention away from them and it puts it on me. Mm. So when I can show up in an event like a 20X and and I can suffer in my silence because I trust that all of us are suffering in our silence and that we're all there to help and support each other, that's the biggest lesson. You know, there's no room for resentment and anger and and self-deprecation. Most times when when terrible things happen to us in life, we say, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why, 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 God, why? I'm not saying I'm perfect because, you know, I've done a lot of work and still things pop up from time to time. But I can say this, going through an event like that changes you because you really know what it's like to suffer with other people and to, in your own suffering, serve others. That's the big takeaway. Hmm. 
That's really cool. Um, Josh, what I ad- admire about your, your sort of lifestyle is that you, you seem to, to go on a, a lot of adventures, a lot of retreats, um, and I'm sure most people don't want to go and do Silfit. But have you got any sort of recommendations of not necessarily a particular place, but, but you're welcome to say that, but perhaps like a particular type of retreat or if someone's feeling like, you know, I'm a bit stuck and I want to – change things, but I, I don't feel like I can do that until I change my environment, go away, get out of what I'm in so that I can really process this. Is there any type of retreat or anything that you would recommend? Well, you know, I'm hesitant to direct people towards plant medicine because plant medicine is not for everyone. But initially, I would say just go to the medicine because you're going to get whatever dose you need. Uh, unfortunately, there's so many centers out there that are not well run. And there's a lot of people that are administering plant medicine, which, by the way, it's illegal. So I'm not going to tell anyone to do anything illegal. In the United States, ayahuasca is is a illegal drug. So I'm not telling anyone to do that. I am going to say this, though. If you start with the breath and you start with meditation, in my opinion, if you have deep healing work to do, all roads lead to plant medicine. Because when you start doing the physical training and the nutrition and the breath work and the meditation and the cold therapy and the float tanks, and you start doing all of these things, whatever is bubbling up, whatever is way deep down in the subconscious, it's eventually going to guide you to plant medicine at some point. But most people, they want to jump right to the plant medicine. And I, and I advise people, hold the bus. Like, don't go just to plant medicine because you've heard that it's good for you or that you're curious. No, plant medicine is a calling. Like, you go to it when you are called. And to, to be honest, I, I'm not called more than once, maybe twice a year to do a deep journey in medicine. Um, I would suggest that everyone starts by doing a three-day silent retreat or a full day immersive breathwork uh, training. Those are the best places to start. I'll tell you why. When you go to a Vipassana, there's nowhere to hide. It's you, your breath, and your thoughts. You could do a three-day meditation, you know, a 72-hour meditation retreat. Um, You'll learn a lot about yourself. You really will because all the the first day, you're just going to cycle down your monkey mind, right? And then days two and three, you're going to be able to sit with what is. And what is, is whatever is running without you paying attention to it inside your head. And by the third day, you'll get some some very big breakthroughs. Um, for people that feel an even stronger call, they can do a 10-day silent meditation, which that's not for the faint of hearts. Like that, that's very, very challenging. I did that. I would not recommend people do that. Um, so then doing a single-day breathwork immersion is fantastic. There's a lot of great breathwork um, events in every town. Um, it's just wherever you live, finding those. So um, stillness and breath to start. And then when you feel the call and only after you feel the call, the deep calling, not just a curiosity, but a calling, then you can go to the medicine for uh, really the ultimate healing that we all deserve. Cool. I, I really like that tip. And um, that is a definite challenge for people out there is a, a 10-day uh, Vipassana. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's not for everyone. <laughs> no. And yeah. so, Josh, I guess – you have been in the wellness industry for a long time and you're one of the, the change makers, I, I like to say. If you were to change something or add something or take away something from the wellness industry, what would it be? Deeper transparency and a matching of vibration, energy and language to who you are on camera versus who you are off camera. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> no, give, give, well, yeah, I get yeah. you, but yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'll I, use, I'll use, I'll use more simplified language. Can you be the same person on camera and off camera? Can yeah. you guide people in wellness with whatever truth you want to speak? And then on top of that, can you do the same thing when the camera's off? Can you have integrity between who you are on and off screen? That's the one thing I think the wellness industry needs right now. I think you're spot on and I um, personally have, have had issues with that because I think it's very hard for me to take photos of myself and videos of myself. Um, and, and it's funny, I, I heard someone say, uh, I think it might have been on a podcast, can you imagine if you did that like 20 or 30 years ago, people would put you in jail. They'd, th- <laughs> <laughs> they'd think you totally. were, there was something mentally wrong with you and, and I still find it very hard to um, to to be that that social media person and, 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 and still keep 
you know who you tr- who you truly are and I guess perhaps that's why I don't post as much or you know it's finding that um just being true to being being your true self and and so how how do you do that Josh how does one be their true selves well how do you how do you be your true self on social media I go to the things that make me feel fear the most I know that's a very um I almost want to say that's like a very uh, canned answer, but it doesn't feel canned when I say it. Mm. Like, but I mean, I, like, yeah. do you? I mean, I saw your post of your recently met queen, who is a beautiful looking lady. Um, so it wouldn't matter what sort of photo you took of her; she'd look great. But you don't take a photo of yourself first thing in the morning, or do you? Like, what? You know, how do you be authentic? Yeah, I've, I, I mean, look, there's that post that I posted was like a celebration post, right? So those are those are easy. It's like, hey, my life is beautiful. Look at me, yay! Like I want to share this joy with my friends, right? Those are easy. The hard posts are the ones where I come back from plant medicine and it's a picture of me looking at the camera and I'm saying all these things that I've let go of that are very intimate, raw, and real. So mm-hmm. I, I do it all. Like I, I don't. I don't only post the beautiful, positive, amazing things. You know, if you look at my Instagrams or anything, there's a lot of, you know, I I did just about uh, two months ago. I, in the beginning of June, I took three days in nature by myself and I wrote a post about this. Like, you know, nature holds the recipe for forgiveness. I had to forgive myself for a lot of things that I was still holding on to and that came through in arrhythmia. And one of those was resentment towards myself and resentments towards my father. And so I did a post about that and it wasn't easy to post that post, but like that's the kind of stuff that serves people because if I'm, if I'm, if the only thing I ever post is like perfect filters, perfect pictures, and I'm never really talking about the uncomfortable things that I'm either throwing up, shitting out or letting go of, well then that's not serving anyone. So the answer to your question of how do I be Josh Trent, I just do it even if it feels scary. You know, Mm. the, the, the one side of Josh Trent that wants to post positive things, I can do that all day. But I make sure that I'm staying aware that the things that I'm still working through, I'm talking about. Like, look, even in this new relationship, like there's parts of me that are afraid. Shit. I mean, it's a new relationship. You know, it's like so exciting. But then I'm like, whoa, the, these old these old feelings are coming up of like, whoa, is this going to work out? Is she the one? Like, And then I go to my breath. Mm. And when I go to my breath, those thoughts don't exist anymore because I'm just here right now. Mm. So, Josh, I think you're spot on and I think the wellness industry is missing that and hopefully, you know, like like every industry, it's probably it's probably missing that. But I've got to ask you, yeah. what is wellness to you? Because I know you ask that a lot and I'd love to hear what wellness is to you today. Yeah. It's this definition has changed for me in the past couple of years because I used to think that wellness was having a healthy body, having money in the bank, having people that care about me. And I think it's much deeper than that for me now. And and really, I think where wellness lives is, is at the axis of this, this physical, this emotional and this spiritual. And I say that one, two, three, not just because it's a triangle. But because each and every one of those physical, emotional, spiritual, they all lean on each other. So in the axis of the physical, emotional and spiritual in the center is wellness. But the only way, Ali, to live my life well is to constantly be cultivating physical, spiritual, emotional intelligence on a consistent basis. So the blending and and the, the nexus of the P, the E, the S, all these things in the center is what ties wellness together. It's how we live our life well. And so if I'm taking loving care of my body, if I'm breathing, if I'm eating nutritious foods, if I'm being aware of my thoughts, you know, if I'm watching my thoughts, if I'm feeling the depths of my feelings, if I'm taking inspired actions, I always describe wellness as as six things. It's eating, moving, sleeping, and our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Those are the six pieces of, of how I see wellness. And, and, you know, those are what actually is the bedrock the foundation for the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional. Mm, I love how you put that. Um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't have put it better myself. Josh, I'm wary of your time, but I've got to ask you one question that we ask all our guests on the show. Do you have a tattoo? I do. 
What is it? The tattoo is, it's a star that I got in Las Vegas. It's a North Star. And right next to it is some Italian scripture that came through to me actually right before I went to the seal fit event. And the, the words are, se posso respirare, posso scegliere. And in Italian, that means if I can breathe, I can choose. And I got that because I really wanted a reminder to give me a reset no matter where I was, no matter what was going on in, in the dark night of my soul or on the sunrise of possibility. Like I wanted a reminder to give myself centering no matter where I was. And I know that if I can remind myself to breathe, to take a deep breath in a medicine journey, in stress, in a relationship. I mean, on this podcast, you know, I've been deep breathing on this podcast as well. If I can breathe, I can choose. And, and what that means is I can choose to make decisions from my heart, to make decisions authentically from who I actually am, if I can remember to breathe. That's great. That is so great. Look, let's leave it on that note because um, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate you coming on today. This was a joy. I appreciate your questions and, and thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.